MedPlum team has been in the healthcare tech industry for like 15 years now through Y Combinator as part of the summer 22 batch. We have some very significant customers today, operations with hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of patients, and that they've trusted MedPlum as one of their primary um, you know, components in their tech stack is, is, it feels very rewarding. If you're a first time entrepreneur or you're just getting started, like being willing to roll up your sleeves and do custom development for organizations is a great way to just get your foot in the door to helping build prototypes, build proof of concepts, build the ones, um, goes a long, long ways to, um, for you as the entrepreneur to like, learn about the space, learn about the opportunity. And I think about my first two or three years in healthcare, I sat in a room with radiologists like daily, just like watching how they use the software and doctors, like they love to complain about software. Do you believe this? Watch how many times I have to click one, two, three. And they're just like, they're going through and they're just like, they're angry because the product was never really optimized for them. The idea of, oh, you're going to, a patient will walk in and a robot will diagnose them and order meds, order tests. I, I don't think that's realistic in the short term, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff in healthcare that is very automatable, such as patients um, sending in messages about questions about billing, questions about insurance. I need to reschedule this appointment. Oh, I need to update my uh, medical history. Those things are not diagnostic. They're not clinical. There's no medical decision-making, but there's a massive amount of human cost that goes into just all of that, like support logistics to keep a hospital running, to keep a doctor's office running. And every single one of those is an opportunity to apply machine learning or to apply like automation to make things easier. There was a lot of consolidation. So hospitals are buying other hospitals and now they need to, to integrate, integrate with each other. Doctors wanted to bring their iPhone into the hospital and they wanted to be able to look at patient data on their iPhone when you can't do that unless everything's on the same network. And so that, that went through a really large transformation over the last 10 or so years. And I think we're still early in that. There's, there's still a lot of software that is very legacy servers on-prem, it's in a rack in the closet, in the basement, and there's a lot of benefits to moving things towards cloud. And if anything, the, the story has flipped so hard that now the story is we don't trust people's local devices. We only want cloud. This happened to me once. I was on a skiing trip and I had a knee injury and I got an MRI at, at the ski facility. And then I went back home and they're like, well, you need to get another MRI because we can't get access to your first one. And so Okay, um, it, it's, it feels like waste, right? It, it's it's a waste of my time, it's a waste of my money, and it's a waste of resources. And that was largely because um, that this data portability and data interoperability didn't exist. And the US government recognized this, that it's like a massive amount of waste and it's just inefficiency. So this data portability is kind of pursuing this further. Um, and we're still early in that. Um, they're not only at the kind of technical level, but also in the incentives level that there's now financial incentives for being able to share more data to reduce the amount of duplicated tests and duplicated scans, et cetera, et cetera. So there's still a lot of opportunity just enabling that um, the data standardization, data interoperability. Um, I put security in that camp as well. The U.S. government is just getting more and more sophisticated about their security requirements, and that creates a lot of you know opportunities to help organizations um, just get buttoned up and compliant on all the security. Even before going to the machine learning applications over this, you know, portable available data, you know, even steps before that for medical researchers, uh, what can they expect or hope for in terms of how available data will be um, and, you know, how things will change in the terms of publications and a great question. And some like really interesting movement there. The historical way was very, very tiny data sets. And so there's lots of papers that get published or research projects that are conducted where they're looking at population sizes of like 50 to 100 patients. It's, it's, it's uh, like tragically small because it was so difficult to get access to data. Anonymization in healthcare is a very tricky topic. Robustly anonymized data is, is a hard problem. And this is potentially another application for machine learning or, um, but just the act of anonymizing it. And it, it's, um, it does not take too many data elements to uniquely identify an individual. It's a hard problem, but there's tooling that's getting better. So maybe the kind of next evolution from anonymization is the synthetic data in healthcare. So this is the process of looking at a, a, a real production live data set and using statistical methods and other kind of algorithmic processing to generate a derivative 
data set that has the exact same shape and characteristics of the original data set in terms of healthcare outcomes and you know, age and basic patient demographics, um, like gender and age, but also like height, weight, um, and healthcare outcomes, what tests have been performed, all, all, all the different healthcare metrics that they can generate that synthetic data set. Um, there's some early players in that space and that are doing well. I think there's still a lot more opportunity um, to kind of move up in sophistication and the statistical accuracy of those synthetic data sets. And, there's, and that will be massive for these clinical researchers. Um, if you can have some kind of statistical guarantee that the data is representative, but you can get access and now you have not a population of 50 patients, but a population of 50,000 patients. With regards to MedPlum, uh, if you are launching a new digital healthcare product or you have an existing digital healthcare product and you want to start thinking more about security or compliance or interoperability or how to just accelerate your overall healthcare software development, I think I, I recommend you take a look at MedPlum. I live in San Francisco. The largest hospital system here is UC SF, the University of California, San Francisco. And their primary healthcare platform is Epic, which is the most commonly used platform for most hospitals. And this is publicly inform information, but they spent about $700 million on their Epic deployment. In my opinion, there hasn't been enough people challenging that status quo. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense. It's a, it's a gauntlet. It's going to take decades to like get to that level. But um, perhaps naively, like we, we're going to make a run for it. We're going to try. Um, and so it's just a matter of like, how do we continue to kind of grow, move up the ladder, move up the sophistication, move up the size of our clients and customers and capabilities.